we like proper order when it comes to things that we like and we want and we bought and we desire, right? Like you, you want your car to work. You want it to be in proper order. Are you with me? When you're waiting in line and someone tries to, some ghetto person tries to cut you, you at that moment value proper order because you've been waiting on line and what they're doing is rude and arrogant and very New York, New Jersey. Right? So you value proper order. Order is what facilitates a blessing. I'll give you the simplest example of a river. Because there's a left and a right bank for the river, it facilitates the flow of the water. If you remove the boundaries, if you remove the order, the order, what happens is this beautiful body of water becomes a dry, parched nothing. Order is what facilitates blessing. And when there is not blessing, usually, sometimes it's a matter of time, but generally, it's usually because things are not in order and there's disorder. So order and disorder are huge. You, I'll give you an example. You look at Haiti. Much of the beauty of that country cannot be actually experienced because of the disorder. A lot of the beauty of the Dominican Republic can be experienced because of order. So I'm trying to paint just a real clear picture to you guys that order is really essential. Good intentions are not enough. We need divine instructions from God. Now Christians, this is the thing about us, we judge everyone else by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. We'll be like, I didn't mean that. Well, that's what you said. <laughs> and if we're just a science, you actually did mean that because it's impossible to say something that you actually haven't thought about. So within your subconscious, you've been entertaining that for a long time. The Bible says out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So that means there's two meanings, out of the overflow or out of the nasty leftover. Your heart speaks. So... Um, good intentions are not enough. And we have to really, we're going we're gonna to see this very clearly. So now I want to go over a few scriptures about scripture. Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. The Greek meaning of the word learning is instruction, teaching, and education. That we through patience say, through patience, through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So let me say it this way, and let me give you a New Jersey. Your education determines your expectation. So if your mind is being renewed, then your heart is expecting something new. To say it this way, what faith believes, hope expects. Patience waits for and perseverance works toward. So this is, this is, this is really important. Here's the second scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition. So he's talking about when the children of Israel were rebellious in the desert. Uh, for our admonition. Now, the meaning of admonition is instruction, warning, or rebuke. So, in other words, we see a lot of craziness in the Bible, and most often, it's what not to do. Like, you see Jesus, that's what to do. Virtually all of the other stuff is what not to do, with a few heroic stories mixed in there, when people did what they were supposed to do and then God showed up. And then sometimes God just shows up in spite of people not doing what they're supposed to do. But anyway, so the scripture 
is these are examples. They were written for our instruction, for our warning, and for our rebuke. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is very important. Did you see this? In righteousness. So if I do all these things, uh, reproof, correction, doctrine, instruction, but not in righteousness, then you damage people. This is the problem with our justice system. The problem with the justice system is that unjust people are administering justice. Right? So this is, if you're going to be someone who handles the word of God, first you have to let the word change your heart, change your life, change your mind, change your behavior, so that you live in righteousness, so that your doctrine, your manner of life, and how you handle the word in people is within the context of in righteousness. This is very, very important. If we don't have this, this all is going to be abusive. If you have this, generally speaking, this all is going to work out and people are going to be healed, they're going to be healthy, and they're going to be instructed, rebuke, correct, but all for their learning, for their instruction, and it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. Now, some of the scriptures that we're going to go over tonight are here. This is where you could <laughs> take your picture because I, I can't get through all of it. I've already, I've already mentally prepared myself to do a round two next week on Wednesday because I'm not going to be able to get through it and I want to make sure that I give this adequate space. This is especially important for worship, for people who are worshipers. And when you are a worshiper, you're not just someone who sings because you can be a singer and not a worshiper. You can be a keyboard player and not a worshiper. You can be a pastor and not a worshiper. You can be a worship leader and not a worshiper. Worship is actually about the surrender and the submission of your life to God, which ultimately means not I sing to him, although that's great, but I actually am convinced that doing things his way is the right way. And it, I begin to then internalize it and then it becomes what I actually want. This happened with David where he says that my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So we always talk about the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. When you get healed and you get mature, your flesh actually learns how to long for the presence of the Lord. Because it has a physical effect on your body, on your mind, your will, and your emotions. And if all of that is doing better, then whatever you're responsible for inherently will be doing better because you're doing better. So if you're doing better, then everything that you're leading and managing and responsible for generally is going to rise. This is why it's more important that you're doing well, like personally, than doing well like just doing things. Because if you're not doing well on the inside, it's only a matter of time before that works its way out into your situation. And then everyone around you finds out, actually, he's not doing well. You know, everyone thought he was doing well, but actually, in fact, he's not doing well. All right, First Chronicles 13. This is a sobering passage uh, it's, it's kind of frightening um, but it's it's really important now this is a passage where the Lord judges and and there's an outbreak of God and it's not like it's not a, it's actually like wow someone's gonna die but you have to remember something anytime in the Bible that you see God act immediately in judgment you have to really really press pause and and observe what's happening and understand this is not a joke this is serious this is serious Isaac spoke the other day about Psalm 19 and one of the one of the statements in Psalm 19 is righteous are your judgments, O God. 
which means God does not know, owe me an explanation for his judgments. In fact, when you read the book of Ezekiel, one of the things that you'll find in Ezekiel several times, you see it, and, and it's like God was like, I'm going to judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord thy God. If you read in the King James, that's what it says. Like, which, which it's saying that in judgment, the knowledge of God is released to a people. This is actually very, very important. Part of God's covenant faithfulness was actually Israel going into exile. If God doesn't do what he said, we can't trust him. So th that's something to consider. Now, 1 Chronicles 13, it says, Then David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, It seems good to you, and, it is, it is, and if it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel and with them to the priests, the Levites, who are in the cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of our God back to us for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Then all the assembly said that they would do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. When leaders don't inquire of the Lord, the people pay. Did you see who he went to first? David consulted with the captains of thousands, hundreds, and with every leader. So David went to the mega pastors. Then he went to the little pastors, the hood pastors. Then he went to the small group leaders. And then he told all of Israel, wrong, wrong, wrong. If you need their affirmation, you can't lead them. Wrong. You always, whether you're responsible for a million people or three people, you always, always go to God first. Always. Mistake number one. He did not go to God first. What you're going to see is an event that is born in disorder and chaos. And watch what it releases. Not good. This is not good. I'm telling you, get ready. Get ready, get ready. This is not good. Now, but David's desire, check this out. His desire is good. His intentions are good. He's actually solving a genuine problem. The ark has been about 14 miles west of the city of Jerusalem for about 20 years, which means the people are not seeking God. They're not inquiring of God. Saul had no interest for the ark. He was into necromancy. He was into using worship to draw people to himself. He was into his public image. He, but he was not into inquiring of the Lord. In fact, it doesn't say anywhere that Saul feared the Lord. David is about to learn the fear of the Lord. He's about to learn, but it's going to be at someone else's expense. Now, so David gathered all of Israel together from Shihor in Egypt as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kirthath, Kirjath, Jerim. And David and all of Israel went up to Bala to Kirjath, Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord, who dwells between the cherubim, where his name is proclaimed. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Benadab and Uzzah and a Ahio, <laughs> it's like drove the cart. Now, I'm going to give you these three names. These three names are part of the story. First of all, Abinadab is the father. He's kind of like in charge. The commentators, uh, the educators, believe that these were actually Levites because the ark was with them. All right? 
So that's what they think. This is what, what we think. Smart people think. Now, Abinadab, his name means father of generosity. How many of you know generosity is a good thing? Right? Okay. Now, Uzzah, his name means strength. Strength. And the other gentleman, that sounds like Ohio, but it's Ohio. That's really not easy. His name means brotherly. So you got family, a father of generosity, and strength. You got good stuff. But they're ill informed. The ark does not go on a cart. If you read in Exodus and you, you, you find out that the ark is supposed to be on the shoulders of the Levites. And there's a warning in Exodus and, and definitely in Numbers that if you touch a holy thing, you die. This is important because... Remember a few weeks ago I was talking to you about Babylon and how the king began to take the vessels from the house of the Lord and drink in them and he was struck that night. Remember that. There was something that was provocative about his behavior. So God is not all uptight about someone in a bar drinking. Because that's what drink, you know, sinners do. That's what we did. That's different than when you do something to desecrate something that is holy. That's different. That is provocative to God. So now, David has good intentions, but things are out of order. David goes to man instead of going to God. He should know better. He has a genuine desire for God. He loves God. He seeks God. He, he's someone, he, you know, he, he has a genuine desire, but he's going to make a terrible mistake because he is ill-informed about how to do what he's supposed to do. And someone else, you're going to read in, in just, just a few verses, they're going to pay. Now, so they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the car. Then David and all, all Israel played music before God with their might, with the singing of harps, with stringed instruments, tambourines, on cymbals with trumpets. And when they came to Shidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and he struck him because he put his hand on the ark and he died before God. And David became angry and caused because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. Therefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day saying, how can I bring the ark of God to me? Do you see his response? <laughs> are you <laughs> Are you guys getting this? This is a red flag, David. A guy just dropped dead. One of your guys drops dead. And you're mad at God, and then you're asking yourself, how do I get the ark to me? <laughs> it's, like, it's really insensitive. It's like the worship leader drops dead. How do I get her keyboard to my house? It's like, <laughs> whoa, like that, this is not, like, we need a new pastor, David. Like, like this is not, I, I don't, but here's the thing, David had a genuine desire for the Lord. It was pure. 
It was right. It was good. But he did not go about it the right way. And someone else suffered because of his ignorance. This is the generation that we live in where people are suffering for the choices of ignorant leaders that want to do something good, but they're hurting people because they're ill-informed. This is, this, is, this is like this event is like a picture of our generation. This is sobering. And we have to really understand that when leaders don't inquire of the Lord, the people pay. So you could want to do something good. You could have a genuine heart to do something good. But if you don't have instructions from the Lord on how to do it, it's not going to be good. So David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. So wherever, let me say this, wherever the presence of the Lord goes, the blessing of God goes with it. This is why we don't, we don't seek blessing. You don't have to seek blessing. You don't have to seek promotion. You don't have to seek. If you seek God, that stuff will seek you. And it's better when it comes upon you than when you go and search after it. Because that's, that's not good. So now the ark is at Obed-Edom's house. And um, th this is, the blessing is, is with the presence. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to 2 Samuel. I, I put that too far, too fast. Let me go back to 2 Samuel 6. This is David. I'm going to read. Verse uh, 6, I'm going to just, for, for the sake of time. And when they came to Nacor's dressing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him for this, uh, for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he named the place Para Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So in Samuel, it says he blessed him and his household, but in Chronicles, it said not only did he bless him and his household, but it, he, he blessed all that he had. When you have something from the Lord that is a blessing, it's almost like there's supernatural longevity on something God gives you. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and doesn't add any sorrow with it. When, when we try to do stuff ourselves, there's just sorrow attached to the struggle. I've experienced this. And in fact, in Timothy, when Paul speaks to Timothy, he says this, those that desire to be rich in this life pierce themselves with many sorrows. It's very different when the blessing of the Lord makes you rich or you try to make yourself rich and you pierce yourself through with many sorrows. The, the most critical thing in your life is the Word and the presence. If you, if you will stay in the Word, if you will seek the Word, if you will seek after the presence of God, Wherever the presence of the Lord is, the blessing of God is. I think that we wear ourselves out seeking the wrong thing. That's what I think. 
I, I mean, I know I can tell you stories of people that sought money, sought money, sought money, and died broke versus people who sought the Lord, sought the Lord, sought the Lord, and are living rich. <laughs> and I'm not saying that, you know, just because you seek after God, all of a sudden you're going to wake up rich. I'm not saying that. But, I, but what I am saying is that where the presence of the Lord is, the blessing of God is also. So if we seek after the Lord in His presence, we will live a blessed life, period. And uh, so anyway, I, I want to, let me show you. Now it was told King David saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom, the city of David with gladness. And so it was, those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces and he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. So now he gets it right. Uzzah, strength, strength has to die at the, hand, at the hands of instructions. You need the instructions of God. We need God's marching orders. God does not need a great idea from Adam. He doesn't need us to brainstorm and draw circle graphs and figure out how we're going to do this and do that. The world does that. And they're anxious on, on pills. They're all jacked up. They're upset. We don't need that. What God is looking for is not that. God is looking for people that say, okay, instruct me how to move. It's teach me how to move. And the scripture actually does teach them how to move. And if they would have did that in the first place, Uzzah wouldn't have died. This is, this, is, this is important. Now, here's the thing. If Uzzah would have, with good intentions, touched the ark, and he would have not died, you know what it says? God is a liar. God cannot be trusted. God shouldn't be feared. Your good intentions are bigger than God. And, and many Christians, they think that their good intentions are enough. But I'm telling you, good intentions will not help us, especially in the days that lie ahead for us. We have got to hear from God. We have got to let God lead us and not live in the presumption of, I know how to do it. You know what presumption is rooted in? Pride. Pride. I know, I know. I got it. Oh, you, bro. I got it. No, oh, yeah? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Not all me. All him. I, I want him to lead me and to speak to me or else we're going to have a problem. This, is, this story is showing you that a desire to do good is not enough. We need directions and instructions from God. This has to get into the heart of God's people. Now, David also is understanding that this is a joyful event and he's sacrificing, which means it's like, think of someone just throwing money up in the air. It's like six steps, throws money in the air. Six steps, throws money in the air. He's, he's offering sacrifice to the Lord because spiritually and intuitively, generosity is a natural outflow of thanksgiving. That's why if you go to a great restaurant and you really had a good time, you give a little extra, it's a natural response Th uh, generosity to thanksgiving. Now, then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. Now as the ark came into the city of David, Michael's, uh, Mikhail, 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 Michael, Michael, Mikey, 
Saul's daughter. Uh oh. Uh oh. I might have butchered her name. Forgive me. So sorry. But here's, here's the problem. You know that she's David's wife? And you know what the scripture is identifying her as? Saul's daughter. That's a problem. That's a problem. We got a problem. Now, listen to this problem. Saul's daughter looking through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in the place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering, offering burnt offerings, plural, and peace offerings, plural, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, both the whole multitude of Israel, both women and men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. He literally fed the whole nation. He, let's continue. Then David returned to his household and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father. Anyway, I was going to say something obnoxious, but I, I reeled it in. Praise the Lord. The Lord is pleased with me. All right. Now, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. See that? That's good. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. <laughs> He's not making it any better. Okay. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. When you judge worship, you become barren. No good. She despised him in her heart. She was insecure. She was jealous. She was misreading the situation. She thought it was about her. She thought it was about David. But David was about the Lord and the people. The scripture is not by accident telling us that she was barren. There is something here. The scripture is showing you the connection between her perception and the output. It's also sobering for her to be identified as Saul's daughter, not David's wife, because that was his wife, and she became his wife because he killed Goliath. Do you remember that? Saul's like, take my daughter. So he did. But this was a situation that led to barrenness. Don't judge worship. Don't judge people's worship. You know, sometimes you go and, and people are in the flesh and, you know, people are crazy. Yep. But there's other times where people are dancing. They're worshiping the Lord. They're working something out. With God. We, I, that's why I love, the, I love the black church. Because they're going to go in. And they're going to, they're going to, I mean, they're going to go in. And there's something beautiful about really dancing before the Lord and just worshiping and just abandoning how people feel about you. Do you think David cares how he looks? 
No, he doesn't care. He's not there to impress anyone. He was there to worship the Lord. Now, the scripture also says that he was wearing a linen ephod, which the priests, I don't know if, if you catch this, but the priests, they had to wear linen, a linen ephod, and in the presence of God, they had to wear linen. Like, you know, the old Dominican guys with the white suits? <laughs> He's like 74. He has like, he has like 33 kids. He's holding a baby. The baby is like three months old. He's like 76. He's got the white linen suit. And like, is that your great grandson? He's like, that's my son. And like, he's, com he's really committed to being fruitful and multiplying. So that was a little culture for you. But the, the linen ephod is the principle behind that is because you cannot sweat in the presence of God. You cannot get into the presence of God by striving. This is important. This is a, you don't sing your way and strive your way. Jesus is the way. Jesus made a way, a new and living way. And you don't come in any other way. There's no other way to the Father except through Him. But within this context, the principle is you don't strive your way into the presence of God. When you look at the Old Testament, there's a lot of patterns and, and there's things there that is really critical for us to see. Another thing is the priest would have a rope tied around his foot in case he would come into the presence of God unsanctified, not forgiven, or in a disorderly fashion, they would drag him out dead. <laughs> we have lost the fear of God. This has to return to the people of God. Now, you're going to see, if you will, I'm not going to do it for you. I'm not going to do it to you. You have to go back to these scriptures. If you read First Chronicles, and if you go 13 and 14, you'll see that the fear of God came to David first, then came to the society or the people at large. Because in, in 1 Chronicles 13, before he takes the ark back in, uh, before he goes and gets the ark, he fights a battle. And God gave him victory. He inquired of the Lord. The Lord gave him victory. And the fear of God was released on the nations that he was fighting. But the fear of God first came to David. The fear of God must first come back to the church and the people of God before it will come to the society at large. This is why you're seeing exposure in the church and the judgments of God and, and things that are wrong being made right and things that are hidden being exposed because judgment starts at the house of God and God wants to restore the fear of the Lord back to the church. If Jesus said, I'll do one thing for you, what is it? I would say, okay, one thing. Just one thing, one thing. I would say, give the fear of the Lord back to the church in my generation because that would make my job easy. <laughs> if you, listen, if you fear God, you're going to behave. If you fear God, you're going to be a good husband. If you fear God, you're going to cook your husband dinner. If you fear God, you're, you're, you're going to raise your children right. If you fear God, you're going to honor God with your finances. If you fear God, you want to serve God. So get, it'll be easy. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be like hanging with real Christians. We have a nice time. We don't fight. <laughs> it's just beautiful. All right. So anyway, now, remember, go to God first, not last. God is not your last resort. You can't lead people if you need their affirmation. This is a big, big thing. Like, you have to get your affirmation from God. We all want to be loved. We all want to be encouraged. Nobody wakes up and goes, how can I make people hate me today? Like, I get all that. Some people may do that, but normal people don't do that. 
And I understand the need, like the desire to be affirmed and loved and celebrated. And I think that that's fine. But if you put that before the Lord, that becomes an idol and will only lead to pain. The fear of man is a snare. It will not do anything good in your life. Good intentions are not enough. You need divine instructions. You can't do God's will your way. This is, this is very American where we sit and we strategize what we're going to do for God and how we're going to make this thing work. And, and I'm telling you, the older I get, the more I don't want to participate with that. Because get a game plan, let God speak to us, but if God is not the one giving the instructions, it just becomes humanism. We don't need more of that. We need people who are listening and, and willing to receive the Lord's instructions. God's judgments are righteous even if we feel angry about them. David was angry that the Lord did what he said he was going to do. You know what that means? His emotions were not sanctified. You, you know, David, let me say one thing. I don't want to go too long, but I want to say this. When you are immature, one of the things that's difficult for you to see is the mixture of your intentions. It took me a long time to come to terms with you're not as pure as you think you are and your intentions are not as pure as you think they are and David wants the ark, but the way he's talking about the ark, I got to get the ark for me. Someone just died. Like there's, there's a level of immaturity with this response and this desire that he's not just desiring God, he's desiring the blessing of God. He doesn't just want God, he wants what comes with God. And the beauty that of God is that he doesn't come, it's not like a stripped down car with no, no power steer, you know, no power windows and no air conditioner. God comes fully equipped. That's why when a believer receives the Holy Spirit, you got all the gifts, you got power, you got authority. I mean, you got, you got the whole package. There's no junior Holy Spirit. You get, you get it all. But his motives were mixed. You can see that by his response. And so you, you have to know, you, you can tell that his intentions weren't right because of him being angry. He should have felt sad. Instead of saying, uh, why did God do that? You're the reason that God did that. You were the one with the bright idea to bring back the ark. And now this guy is dead because of you, because you didn't seek, the, you did not inquire of the Lord. You did not get instructions from the Lord. Now this guy is dead. That's why it's really critical for leaders to get the heart of God before they move. Get the heart of God. All right. Now, the fear of the Lord must return to the people of God before it returns to the society at large. God is to be feared. Yahweh is not a joke. We have to get this like God is patient, but God is not stupid. Do you know that as soon as the ark was put on the cart, they weren't struck dead right away? So don't think that God's patience with us is his approval. It's not his approval. We think that sometimes because there's not consequences immediately that there's, there's going to be no consequences. And there was consequences and Uzzah died because David did not have instructions. He did not inquire of the Lord. And it all started with him going to people before he went to God. And that, let me show you this. Every time you put something else before God, it's destined to fail. It's destined 
to not succeed. So if you have put something before God, repent, ask God to forgive you, ask for a clean slate, put Jesus first, make him first, and then you're building on a sure foundation. The people that gave him the go-ahead, they didn't die. They didn't have a son buried. See, th this, is, this is something. God really wants to release the fear of the Lord back on the church. Let's pray. Father, we know that you're a good God, a loving God, and a patient God, a merciful God. But we really need you to release the fear of the Lord for those who are here, for those who will watch. But within our generation, we need a fresh release of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. According to Isaiah 11, the fear of the Lord is what helps us to respond to the Lord correctly, immediately. God, we ask you to release the fear of the Lord on your people, Father, for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.